let me start off, uh, Professor, by uh, kind of addressing what I've seen a, a lot over the recent year and two is this viewpoint from the client's perspective, the client-centered approach, as I've called it a lot. And it does a lot have to do with value because what we think of value from our profession from the inside the law office is very different from the client's perspective of value. Um, as we break down these barriers from the attorney perspective, how can we start making improvements by defining what are those big barriers to get to the client to address their value? And how once we have identified the barriers, how can we start to break them down? I know that's a huge question, but it's kind of a starting point. No, it's a, it's a really important one. And uh, I do think it's very, very important to recognize that uh, we too often think of things from the lawyer's point of view, right? In fact, uh, again, I only half jokingly say we're the only profession in the world that divides the world between lawyers and non-lawyers as if these are two equal groups. Here's a hint. There are a lot more of them than there are of us and our, we are there to serve them. Uh, and so the first thing I think we need to do is uh, to listen, uh, listen to our clients, but not even our, not just our particular clients, but also to listen to what's happening out there in the world. Uh, and because those are the things that are shaping our, our clients and our world. People often say to me, why is the legal profession changing so much? I said, here's a hint. Because the world is changing. And, you know, we are, uh, law and lawyers are a lagging, not a leading indicator of change. Meaning we follow the broader changes in the world and society. And that's around technology, around globalization, around uh, sustainability, around social justice, all of these issues. That's the, the first thing. I think the second thing is to make conscious effort to integrate the legal service we're providing into the problem solving that the that the lawyer, the clients are looking for it, uh, your clients I, I always say to people your clients don't have legal problems they don't they have problem problems of which what they would really like to do is to take the legal part and reduce it to as small a part as possible so they could focus on the thing they actually care about, which is the, either the business problem or the interpersonal problem or the political problem or the strategy problem, whatever it is. And I think it takes a certain amount of humility on our part to understand that we, to be effective, have to make our help and advice, which I know we want to give, fit within the parameters of the actual problem the client is facing. I think if we can begin to do that, we can open up a dialogue with our clients about how to best help them. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought up generational differences. Um, that's something we've talked about a lot at our at our organization throughout Illinois. I've heard it on the national stage repeatedly. And you, you proactively mentioned Gen Z, uh, and that's come up recently. What have you seen from your perspective? Obviously you're in law school and you've been there uh, for a long enough time that you've experienced these different types of students. And now the Gen Z is soon following. How do you, what advice can you give these attendees who are watching on how this generation be them clients or be them how you call them elevator assets. Once they're coming shoulder to shoulder to ride the elevator up to work with us or we're working for them, how are these clients different and how do we need to see from their viewpoint differently than we ever have before? So thanks for reminding me, everybody, how old I am, Mark. I, I appreciate that. And I am old. It is true. But I will just say that beats the heck out of the alternative. But anyway, um, here I have seen a lot and, and I'm lucky. I feel privileged to be surrounded by young people all the time and they stay young as I get older. Uh, but I just taught my last class uh, Tuesday. And, uh, and I've been thinking a lot about this. 
so I'd say a couple of things. One, um, what I said in the talk, I firmly believe these uh, young people really want to do big things. You know, in fact, part of the, we don't do this so much, but you know, the rap on millennials is, oh, they don't want to work hard. They don't want to, and I say, oh yeah, they don't want to work hard. What do they want to do? They want to solve global warming. They want to solve human trafficking. They want, they have no ambition, right? No, they have big, giant ambition. But there are also two other things. They're in cynical and skeptical because they have been, not to point, put too fine a point on it, lied to about a whole range of things, about how the world works and about what they've been told. And they're also uh, afraid in some ways. Look, they've lived through, okay, even Gen Zs have lived through three different recessions in 22 years. Uh, of which the last two are quite salient, right? So maybe they don't remember much about 2001, but 2008, they remember very vividly and many of them saw their parents struggle and now they're all living through 2020, okay? Baby boomers didn't have that. We pretty much were on a constant upward escalator from the 1950s until the, the dawn of the new millennium with maybe a little blip in 1988 or 89. That is a huge difference, okay? And they live in a world that is saturated with information, overflow of information, misinformation. And so it makes them quite skeptical of what they are told particularly when they're being told things like do as I say, not as I do, or, or do it the way we did it because we always did it and that's the right way to do it. I think we need to approach it in exactly the opposite way. Not telling young people all the things that we did right about the world, but actually being quite candid about all the things we did wrong about the world and listening to them about new ideas about how we might move forward. And, you know, just if you take the simple example of how to deal in a hybrid world of work, they live in a hybrid world all the time. They grew up, their entire lives have been lived in a hybrid world between online and in person. They have a huge amount to teach us. They're way more worldly than we were when they were our age. Most of my students have not only taken time off between college and law school, many of them have lived in other countries the number of international JD students, so I mean students who were born outside the United States or did their first degree outside the United States who are now here for a full three-year JD degree, many of whom would like to stay in this country, and I, um, is enormous. And the amount of learning that they can bring to us will open our eyes and will help us to deal with this transition. I'll just say this last thing. Here's another statistic that blew my mind. We are in the midst of the largest wealth transfer in the history of the world between baby boomers and Gen Xers and millennials and Gen Zs. It's something like, uh, the estimates are something like $18 trillion. So they are going to be running the world in quite short order. And we need to be engaging with them about what they know and what we know and how to make the world work better. That's great. Um, Professor Wilkins, I, I have a question from the audience that wants to get your views on how um, economic disparity and the erosion of democracy figure into some of the views you expressed from the legal profession on social responsibility and social justice and stability. Um, put that question up on the screen. Where where do you see these fitting into that view, and, and especially in recent times? It's hugely important. And obviously, we're all 
watching the daily news and, and understanding these critical points. But it's not just Ukraine, okay? It's democracy here at home. And I'm not going to talk politics here, but everybody has a stake in the fairness of our elections, in uh, the openness of our democratic process, in where, uh, in the accuracy of the information that people are receiving about what's happening in the country and around the world. And lawyers have a critical role to play here, okay? And it's why, as I said, you know, we're not going to, we are not going to, nor should we fully deregulate the legal profession because the legal profession is intimately tied to fundamental values that are core to the rule of law and our, to our democratic society. But uh, again, back to put it back with the issue of generational change. Uh, I, I think we have a dangerous skepticism that's brewing every place about whether those values are real and what our real commitment to them is and uh, about how to make them real for everyone in our society. That is a challenge, uh, but it's also an opportunity. Uh, if, if people say, how do we attract bright young people to come to law school? We attract them by saying our profession is in the center of these debates. So all that stuff I said about sustainability and social justice and climate change and all of those issues, the lawyers are at the center of these debates. And that's exciting. That should be exciting for everyone. And you could be a lawyer in a big company and how to how you're going to address those critical issues, or you could be a lawyer in a in a small or medium sized law firm working with your clients around these issues, or a lawyer in government, or a judge. I, I think we should be proud of our role here, but we are going to be held accountable for how we exercise uh, that power and authority we've been given. There's a lot in the news lately uh, about legal regulation, re-regulation, changes in uh, rules, proposals, different states trying different things. Uh, a question brings up um, how this all impacts legal services uh, like it has other places. Uh, where do you see this going? And I know this is a whole other can of worms to open, but in general terms, where does this play a role in the, in the evolution of our profession? Look, uh, and the Chief Justice alluded to this. I mean, you've got uh, Arizona and Utah and uh, Washington State. It's interesting. It's a lot of states that are out on the West Coast, which is not surprising if you just kind of think about the kind of traditions out there that are experimenting with the, what they, I think, are calling a regulatory sandbox. And to be honest, we in the United States are at some level, following developments that are happening in the world. Uh, the UK, 10 years ago, pretty much deregulated all of the traditional restrictions on the forms of legal practice. Now, it doesn't mean there's no regulation. That's completely false. They have actually, in some ways, a more highly developed regulatory system than ours, but it's one that is moving, and this is something I, I both think is coming and I applaud towards what you would call a more evidence-based regulatory system. That is, it doesn't just make assumptions that, quote, non-lawyers could never understand how to practice law or no valuable services can be delivered through legal technology. Uh, the first speaker referenced LegalZoom. LegalZoom is the most recognized legal brand in the world. And it's for a reason. It's for a reason that it delivers a lot of services that people want. Look, I think lawyers have a critical role to play. I hope I have said this enough times that people believe that I mean it. But anybody who thinks we will solve the access to justice problem by giving a individual lawyer trained in the way in which we train lawyers today to every person who has a legal problem is not looking at reality. It's impossible. 
We'll never, we have a million point, 1.3 million lawyers in the United States, more lawyers than almost any place else in the world. And we don't come close to providing enough legal services and pro bono and public service, as important as they are, are never going to do it. We need to be thinking about how do we leverage technology? How do we leverage paraprofessionals? How do we leverage alternative dis uh, delivery systems? to help close the gap because the, the the answer isn't is a uh, is a computer program or a paraprofessional better than Mark Palmer you're not going to get Mark Palmer unless you can afford Mark Palmer let's just be blunt it's better than do it yourself by yourself no assistance which is where most people are in this country today. And if we don't say that clearly, we lose credibility and with the people who need our services and the people, quite frankly, who are increasingly pushing the regulatory system. I'll just end by saying this. Anybody who's gotten their COVID test lately or their COVID shot lately, you haven't seen a doctor. Doctors don't do that. These are done by the physician's assistants, nurse practitioners, we have a huge uh, delivery system, technology. We are at home COVID tests. We could never, if you had to go get, see a doctor in order to do anything with COVID, we would still be living in our houses, not able to go outside. Think about it like that. I see, I see a comment uh, from Matthew that brings up the billable hour. And he, he prefaced the comment by including how will this help uh, attract and retain underrepresented attorneys, be them women or the next generation and so forth. Where do you see the billable hour fit into this equation? So you told me I was old already, Mark. So I'll just tell you, I'm old enough to remember that like in 1986, when I came back to teach, people were saying, oh, the billable hour is dead. We won't have billable hours. Okay. The billable hour is a complicated thing and it does fulfill a certain need. Because here's the problem with legal services. Uh, they're very hard to measure and evaluate. Uh, and I think one of our biggest challenges is that we have thought that they were impossible to evaluate from an output or quality metric and instead have only relied on input-based metrics. And this goes to the call to the uh, question, who did it? Which means where'd they go to law school? You know, uh, what are their credentials? Oftentimes, let's just be blunt. What do they look like? Do they look like a lawyer? Do they have the right cut of the jib? You know, do they fit our mental stereotype of a lawyer? Which we know, of course, has dramatic consequences for issues of diversity and inclusion. All of these things do, as do the billable hour in the sense that it rewards inefficiency. I, again, we, this is the way our clients see it. And it's oftentimes the way in which our people see it, that if I do my work quicker and faster, my hours are lower. And that's not just about how I build the clients, it's how I'm evaluated by my superiors in legal organizations. I think uh, the $64,000 question, as we used to say when $64,000 was a lot of money, some of the of you are old enough to remember that. Now it's just the first level of deal or no deal or something like that, uh, is how can we measure the quality of the output of services? This goes to what I said about evidence-based regulation. We need to think about if we're evaluating a service, how do we evaluate its quality as received by users and by all the different things we're trying to achieve? You know, when you go to eat out, you don't actually, maybe you look to see what the credentials of the chef were, you know, who he or she cooked with, you know, what is her resume is. But mostly you go to Yelp and you go to say, what did somebody like me think about that restaurant, right? 
What is, uh, you know, what are people evaluating the quality? And then when I eat there, I try to contribute to that idea of measuring quality of outputs. The legal services are not as simple as dinner, okay? I get that. But we have to begin to think about what makes good lawyering other than either inputs or completely subjective evaluations after the fact, like I know it when I see it. I often tell lawyers that if your best output-based quality metric is most associated with Justice Stewart's definition of pornography, you're probably not in a very good place. And our clients are increasingly sophisticated, just like they're using to evaluate the quality of their streaming service and their dinner and their automobile repairs. And we are seeing increasing metrics of accountability that are going to be directed towards lawyers and legal services. And if we want to be a part of that discussion, we can't just say it's impossible. We have to enter into a real dialogue about what makes a quality legal service and how it can be measured and evaluated. Well, that cues up very, very well our, our upcoming speaker who's going to talk about measurement of value. Exactly. Greg Lambert. Um, We've talked a lot about different kinds of clients, sophisticated clients, corporate clients, um, millennial clients, the next generation and so forth. I want to pivot to another type of client, and that's a client that we don't see because they're unseen or they don't even know they have a legal problem to begin with. This cues up the classic access to justice problem where not only do we get them the resources and the services beyond just resources, but we have to make them aware that they have a legal solution to a legal problem or to a problem in and of itself. Where do we begin with fostering change in our profession to better address this overall access to justice to all the thousands, if not millions, who are falling through the gaps who we could be serving? Uh, you're completely right. That is the most important thing. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever seen, if I had a blackboard, if I was doing this, I'd draw a pyramid right? In which potential legal problems are this huge base down on the period, period. And then the number of people who even recognize that is a much smaller number. And then the number of people who actually even take it to some kind of third party or some kind of advice giving is a much smaller. And it's only when you get up to the narrow little tippity top of the pyramid that you get to a lawyer and you get to a legal resolution, okay? That is a huge problem. Now, lawyers, I think, have often tried, and I'm really uh, I'm proud of lawyers, things like you know going into schools, street law clinics, going into places to try to make people aware of their legal rights. Whatever one thinks about lawyer advertising, if you have an asbestos claim, you're much more likely to know about it today than if there was no advertising, okay? But this is just the tip of the iceberg. And again, how do people find out about their rights and interests more generally? It's through technology. It's through the media. It's through lots of other kinds of delivery mechanisms. It's not going to an expert who tells you what your issues are, right? It's about education. It's about access to information. And I think, again, we as lawyers have to be more open to making our legal knowledge more accessible and available so that people can recognize that they might have a legal problem. And some of those problems are not problems, frankly, that would ever make sense to take to a lawyer for a whole variety of reasons like cost and and time and all that, but some of them are. And the more people who can understand how lawyers can help them in ways that are not just the stereotypical one, which is, you know, file a motion, file a case in court and five years later, get an outcome, but instead might have to do with all sorts of ways in which we help build capacity in people to resolve their own problems or 
providing limited kinds of advice that, you know, can help them to get to a certain place where then they can take it on their own. Again, these regulatory sandboxes and these new uh, providers who are interested in mobilizing technology to help ordinary people gain access to the law and all it offers them, not just for resolving problems, but for facilitating transactions and building wealth and all the things that individuals need, that's the most important thing in the future. And I tell my students all the time, you know, you want to become like the next Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> you know, or be, don't go, you know, uh, uh, become some kind of investment bank or whatever. Figure out how to get ordinary people access to basic legal information and services. And you know what? People will pay for that. Maybe they're paying $10. But among, across the tens of millions of people who, no law, who don't have that access now, there's a very successful business model in there sometimes. Yeah. And that fits perfectly with how you describe the, the complementary competencies, how it's more than just the foundational substance of law that we have, have ingrained and that we take CLEs to continue that knowledge going forward through our career, but the business side, the people side, the communications elements, and so on. Fabulous. Um, we're almost out of time, uh, but I wanted to leave you with one last question, Professor Wilkins. Um, you, you introduced yourself at the top of the hour as a Chicago native, and so I want to leave you on that note with an opportunity to share with any lessons that you have from those formative years in Illinois and in Chicago that you still find yourself running into today and through your career um, that you have brought with you. Well, I'm still a Chicagoan and my mother is 93 years young. She probably wouldn't want me to say her age in a public setting. Lives in uh, uh, Hyde Park where I grew up. Uh, and uh, I get to Chicago wherever I, whenever I can. And I do so for many reasons, but maybe apropos of your uh, question is this. Um, you know, Carl Sandburg said it, Chicago is the quintessential American city. And actually anybody who comes from overseas, from Europe or Asia or whatever, when they go to Chicago, they recognize that there's something kind of uniquely American there. And it has to do with the diversity of the city, you know, it's racial diversity, which now I'm proud to say is much more a strength than a source of conflict where it was when I was uh, growing up, but it's become even more diverse in every single way. It's so much more international. It's so much more cosmopolitan. It's so much more uh, connected uh, across the different neighborhoods. And yet the neighborhoods are still there. I love the neighborhoods. That's also a strength of Chicago, that there are still important neighborhoods where people's ethnic identity and racial identity still matters. Uh, that's really quite unique. It's also the place uh, where in the Midwest that, that continued to thrive as much of the rest of the Midwest for various reasons did not. And as a legal profession, it's always been a very important legal profession. In fact, actually the Chicago legal profession for those of you on the call who are interested, is undoubtedly the most studied legal profession in the world because the American Bar Foundation, which is a part of the ABA, uh, is located in Chicago and they have been researching the Chicago legal profession now since uh, the 1970s. Uh, and I have learned a tremendous amount about that from that research and what I think it shows is that uh, a bar that has to, by necessity, incorporate everything from ethnic and racial diversity to uh, everything from the representing the largest and most important global companies in the world to vibrant solo and small firm practitioners that has a very, very uh, well-established government uh, uh, lawyering sector at every level. You know, in fact, we even have county lawyers. So we have local, county, state, 
and obviously federal, a fantastic judiciary. This program is a uh, is in fact a, uh, a a testament to the fact that this has been a leading bar uh, and led by a leading Supreme Court uh, uh, about the issues that are facing our world today. So uh, I, uh, when people ask me where I'm from, I still say Chicago, even though I've lived in Boston a very long time. I'm, I, and I was just as happy for the Bulls last night as I was for the Celtics. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Professor Wilkins. It's been a pleasure having you. And uh, we thank you for all your insights. And I appreciate it.